Well, thanks for um, coming out today. We're, we're thrilled to have um, Patrick and Brian out to visit. I want to take a little bit of time, just introduce our, our lab a little bit, the Natural Resource Analysis Center. Most of you are familiar with it. So let me do uh, just a couple slides on, on the Natural Resource Analysis Center here at WVU. We've been around for over 20 years now, specializing in all kinds of geographic information system science, remote sensing, modeling, a fairly rich history. We have Mike Stregers here with us. He's been with the lab for 15 years. And actually, I got my start working with Mike um, years and years ago and as a student and then came back, um, of course, as a staff member. So one of the things we're doing quite a bit of right now is um, airborne LIDAR acquisition processing analysis. That's been very exciting, very challenging. We've mapped over a third of the state of West Virginia so far. And Adam Riley's with us here. He's been really instrumental in that program. And so that's really given us a, a very personal, intimate look at remote sensing in, in a manned sort of way, where you have someone actually in an aircraft operating a sensor. A lot of the concepts, I think, are going to be transferable to um, UAVs or UASs. What do you all prefer? Well, uh, we, we call them aerial camera platforms, actually, although the current term of art is UAS, okay. Unmanned Aircraft System. Okay, so we, we're hoping that a lot of what we've learned um, and our experience will be transferable to, to this scenario. Obviously, we're very excited to have these guys here, and I'm, I'm going to hurry up so I don't take too much time. But in any event, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about our lab, and these are some of the things that we've been involved in. Stop up and see us sometime if you get a chance. The genesis of this effort um, really stems from the West Virginia Division of Natural Resources. Right now, um, we have an agreement, a cooperative agreement with the DNR to support stream restoration, primarily in the uh, Monongahela forest areas where we're really interested in trout and native trout. And so obviously it's a much higher elevation systems that we're concerned with. We've done quite a bit of in-stream restoration, habitat enhancement, and fish passage burial removal. And those are some pictures you'll see on your slide. That's a, on Beaver Creek, which is a tributary to Shaver's Fork. And what's important about that work is brook trout are somewhat like a salmon. They like to return to the tributaries and spawn. And what's happened up there since the logging and railroad influence is that a lot of these tributaries have been cut off and isolated. So we have a lot of isolated brook trout populations up there. This was an extremely famous watershed. Mr. Edison, Mr. Ford, a lot of people came there at the turn of the century to fish. And then, of course, it was logged. Some of the wood that came from that mountain went to, into the Wright Brothers' first aircraft, which is kind of interesting. And you'll see that this week, um, or see the area. So in any event, we've, we've done quite a bit of um, restoration, not only in building fish ladders, if you will, replacing culverts, but also in stream restoration. One of the biggest limiting factors in that system up there is temperature. We're able to address physical habitat. We're able to address chemical issues by liming the stream and bringing pH up to an acceptable level. Um, Temperature still is elusive. That's a problem that we're going to deal with, and it's certainly with climate change. It's something that we're looking towards climate change resiliency. How can we do restoration that if indeed we see warmer climates? Trout love cold water, of course. So temperature is very important. Dr. Petty and our wildlife and forestry division of um, the Davis College has done I don't know, 15 years of work up here, actually marking fish. We're using telemetry to look at individual fish, and his research is fascinating. I encourage you to look at it. And part of his research, he's kept a temperature log, basically a profile along the Shaver's Fork, but that's just it. It's a profile. There are temperature loggers that are set so many increments downstream. Well, that gives us an idea of the temperature longitudinally, if you will, but we really don't have a spatial rendition or a spatial understanding of that temperature. And that's very important because trout, especially in the summertime, we've recorded temperatures up to, I think, 90 degrees Fahrenheit at Cheat Bridge, which is the lower end of the watershed we're working on. Now imagine that, you know, non-trout aquatic life would be taxed by those type of temperatures. So what do they do to survive? They find thermal refugia, and that's places where the stream interacts with groundwater or a spring or a tributary. And some of our restoration techniques we suspect will actually help with 
temperature with keeping temperatures lower by aerating the water and, and moving the water faster through zones that won't get as much solar radiation if it's moving faster. So, so having said all that, we really need to map the spatial distribution of temperature, surface temperatures, and this system as well as many other systems. And how do you do that? We have the, the idea, why don't we look into UAS technology? Why don't we look into very small thermal imaging systems and started talking to Patrick and Brian and here we are today. So we're very thankful that they've made the trip here to be with us and educate us. So welcome guys and thank you for being here. Well, thank you all for having us here, and thank you particularly to Paul and all of his colleagues here. We obviously wouldn't be here without their support and interest, and so we're, we're delighted to have this opportunity to come here and talk to you today. Okay, what we do, we fly remote control multi-rotor aircraft equipped with first-person view systems. And now, right now, I'm sure all of you are thinking, yeah, well, but what does that mean? So anyway, I thought what I'd do is sort of walk you through this in two parts. First, what is a multi-rotor aircraft and how does it work? And secondly, how, um, what is FPV and how does that work? First of all, I sort of, what are the, what this right here, our own RQCX3 Raven is a multi-rotor aircraft. It's um, capable of taking off and landing and hovering just like a helicopter can, so it's got that kind of maneuverability to have in your mind. It's battery powered, runs off lithium polymer batteries, and it's very, as you can hopefully tell by looking at it, it's very mechanically robust and simple. This is what we call a hexacopter, a six-bladed helicopter, and the only moving parts are the six electric motors. So that's a nice thing, is that it's very, very simple mechanically. So it operates, so there's not a lot of things to go wrong with it, basically. That's what makes it robust. It's compared to a helicopter, it's more stable and easy to pilot, easier to learn to fly. Um, however, when you contrast it with a helicopter or a fixed wing platform, I know we've got a fixed wing UAS, person with us today, it can't carry the payload of a, of a conventional helicopter with a main rotor and a tail rotor, nor does it have the persistence, which is to say the flying time of a fixed wing aircraft. So these are fixed pitch props as found on normal airplanes. Sir? What's the advantage of the six over the four like in your picture gives you? Uh, primarily stability. Uh, basically it's six points at which the craft can kind of counter uh, wind coming at it or or a little bit more lift in this case, also larger. Uh, these are the same motors on that craft there, but there are more of them, so it can lift a little more. Yeah, the sort of gross payload is higher, greater stability, and a degree of redundancy. In theory, this aircraft could lose a motor and keep on going. I mean, it'd be a controlled crash versus a direct just crash. <laughs> <laughs> you might ask yourself, how does something with no control surfaces and you know fly, no servos, anything like that? And so, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, an aircraft has three axes of motion, pitch, which is forward to backwards, roll, which is side to side, and yaw, which is pivoting the nose. It accomplishes all those just with these propellers. In order to do pitch, it slows, say, say you want to pitch forward to achieve forward movement, you slow down the propellers in the, in front, the front, there, and then you speed up the ones in the back. And, and so... It just rocks the tip forward, therefore moves forward. So, you know, if you speed up the ones on the left, the ship moves to the right. And then yaw, the nose-to-nose -nose thing, uh, takes advantage of the torque effect. So with three propellers turning in one direction, three in the opposite direction, it just raises the power on three and lowers it on three and the thing twists. Now the yaw authority, since it's doing that, is, is relatively mild. You can't flip around in a big hurry, but it gets the job done, though it goes fast enough. Because three props will, will make the aircraft fly. And then, as we touched on briefly, multi-rotors are totally dependent on thrust to stay in the air. They have no capacity to glide or to auto-rotate or anything. So if you lose power, it's coming down Pretty right quick, where it is. Yeah. And, and in a hurry. <laughs> um, this, I just put this together. This is, this is also in your handout. But this is just a general description. There's obviously enormous variation from one individual system to the next. But just a general description of the capabilities of these kinds of aircraft. Flying time between seven and 15 minutes, takeoff weight between three and six pounds. Raven here is our benchmarks having flown a little over 40 miles an hour. The maximum altitude is 400 feet, though that's established by law. It could, in theory, go quite a bit higher than that, but you know, obviously you'd be in contradiction of the laws at that point. Maximum proven range, again with this aircraft, is about half a mile. The nacelle span is, um, multi-rotors are measured from the tip 
of the motor shaft on one side to the tip on the opposite side. So this is what's called a 550 class. It's 550 millimeters from one tip to the other. Uh, Multi-rotors, dimensions are always given in millimeters. We give it commands. This is a fairly standard 2.4 gigahertz hobby controller, you know, two joysticks, each one controlling two of the, uh, the forces of flight and then various switches and knobs to control other things. That's at 2.4 gigahertz. We have a number of options for uh, broadcasting video back to ourselves. That's, we do that at 5.8 gigahertz, so there are alternatives. Uh, like I mentioned, it uses rechargeable batteries and those can run up to about 10 amps. Then the second part of the equation is FPV, first person view operation. Now what this means is that the pilot is seeing in real time what the aircraft is seeing along with telemetry and that's essentially how you fly it. You, it's as if you're on board, that's why it's first person view. So you're looking at it and whatever you see is what the aircraft's seeing. So it's quite natural to say turn to the left and just your view as the pilot shifts to the left. And so that's how that works. You know, basically we use a variety of cameras in the front here, whether it's our little low light camera, our GoPro, or a FLIR imager in this case in some cases. Typically we have it facing forward so the craft turns as we turn. Being a multi-rotor can go in all directions, it's easier to kind of orient yourself that way. But, you know, a thousand feet down range you can't physically see it, so it's kind of required to do that. We also run a pretty wide angle field of view for the most part so we can have a little more situational awareness. Basically what we did for the FLIR for this application, the FLIR has to be aiming straight down at all times into the water. So I basically repurposed a pan tilt gimbal, gimbal normally used for fixed wing aircraft for looking around as you're flying and have it positioned straight down. So I mount the FLIR here, it focuses down and as the craft tips forward, it will automatically tip the gimbal around to keep the FLIR aimed at the water. Now that's tied into the flight control system. It's actually a standard feature of the flight control system to have a gimbal, just normally not down though. It just needs to be just kind of, I don't know, kind of recreated a little bit. But this was a, an easy solution to the problem. These are very popular as, um, as aerial camera platforms, both for you know, potentially professional applications. Uh, real estate photography is one you hear over and over again. But also just for people to go out and fly for fun. And so, um, so oftentimes, uh, if you want to get nice, clean video, you use a gimbal to stabilize the camera. We, as you can tell there, just have the camera on a fixed mount because that way if the aircraft is caught in a wind and drifting to the right or whatever, you know, we can see that. We don't, essentially, we don't want to have aircraft motion compensated for because you could be way pitched over and not even realize it if the camera was so nicely writing itself. So, uh, just, uh, just some additional points about uh, first-person view operations. To use um, a first-person view system, you have to have a, your ham radio license because of the frequencies you're operating on and the power you're operating with. As a pilot, you're either watching through a pair of video goggles, which uh, Brian will uh, now model for you. To uh, we, th When you put these on, you get what we call the full Geordie LaForge effect. <laughs> Take the age of the room there. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is very nice because it's immersive. You, you know, obviously all you're seeing is what the aircraft is seeing. An alternative now is um, on the bottom would be just to get like a small monitor which you could watch on. Uh, however, especially when you're getting started, that can be somewhat perilous because you will inevitably find your eyes jumping from your monitor up to your aircraft. And on your, if, if the aircraft is flying towards you on the monitor, left is left and right is right. But the moment you look up, right is left and left is right. So that's a recipe for crashes. Don't ask how we know that. In addition to the pilot, I, it's crucial to have a spotter. In fact, that's one of the reasons there are two of us, is that one of us is piloting, the other one acts as a spotter. And also, we found it useful to have the spotter ask, just ask questions like, what's your battery supply at? What's your altitude? Because when you're the pilot, particularly if you have a mission like we have here, you can tend to get fixated on accomplishing that mission. You know, we just want to stay right over that stream, hypothetically in this case. So the pilot's really zeroed in on that and they're not paying attention to what the machine is telling them about, uh, you know, about its operation, about the level of battery, whatever. And then finally, on this next frame, we've got an example <coughs> of the pilot's eye point of view. This is, this is precisely what the pilot sees through their goggles while flying. What you just saw there was a changeover from the GoPro camera to a Raven's low light camera. This video was actually captured on board Raven. And uh, she typically flies with two cameras, the, the GoPro obviously for capturing beautiful HD video and just for general flight, and then a low light camera as a backup 
you know, for, uh, for flying in low light, obviously, or if we're, um, you know, if something goes wrong with the GoPro, it has its own independent battery, which could run down. So now that it's stopped, I will just briefly walk, or maybe I can, the advantage this way is I can replay it. You can use also the mouse. And I can use the mouse. So what you're seeing here is um, on the <coughs> left-hand side of the screen is your airspeed, that ladder, so flying at about 10 miles per hour there. The right-hand side, that's your altimeter, so we're 111 feet up there. At the center is a, a compass, and then across the bottom you see a satellites, or sat, that's 10 satellites in view for GPS. HDP is a measure of GPS accuracy, which I think a, a total disaster is like 27. Anything below one is extremely accurate. Dis, distance in the middle is how far we are from home. RQCX3 aircraft designation, just in case you're really tunneled in and forget what you're flying. Um, and across the top there, uh, this is actually the little camera is an icon coming through straight from the GoPro, as is the clock in the center. That's how long the GoPro has been recording. The numbers immediately to the right of that are an indicator of pack voltage, i.e. how much juice is coming out of it, and then uh, amp meters, which is how many milliamps we've pulled out of it, and then to the, uh, in the far right corner, battery indicators for the GoPro. We're big believers in the pilot having control of the aircraft at all times. And that, that's, that's a choice we've made, you know, and, and technology is, some, some people I suppose would consider us even a bit archaic because of that, but that's the way we do it. The alternative is, is not only can you have um, GPS sort of lock on and hold its position, you can actually, as you see on the slide here on the screen, assign a flight control system waypoints, which it will execute entirely autonomously. So, you know, you press go and then I suppose stand back and watch. If you really want to learn to fly, do this. Step one, get a simulator. There are a number of really good ones which allow you to use either a real radio or something that looks exactly like a real radio. So you build the muscle memory in how to control the aircraft. Step two, get a little itty bitty thing you can fly around your house and fits in the palm of your hand. That right there is the Blade MCX. We both have one. Very nice little training instrument. Your cats will love it, I promise. <laughs> Step three, fly a full-sized aircraft out of doors. That right there you see depicted is a DJI hexacopter, which is uh, one of the rising stars of the field right now. And then step four, bust out the goggles and go FPV. You cannot get around needing to have those basic flight skills to control the aircraft, sadly. I tried, didn't work. Do you, do you need a, um, a ham radio license to, to fly and even a monitor? I mean, you said you do for FPV, but. Well, actually, only for a certain amount of power. If you can deal with 25 milliwatts and maybe 100 feet range, you're fine, you're legal. Anything above that requires a ham radio license for the power you're using. Yeah, and FPV just refers to is, is regardless of using goggles or a screen okay. or I don't know what else you might do, but it's any it's basically it's the, you're transmitting video. That's the issue, not what sort of instrument is receiving that video. In the 2012, Congress instructed the Federal Aviation Administration to come up with a plan to integrate drones into the national airspace. In addition to that, there were a bunch of sub deadlines leading up to that big deadline. The FAA has blown every single one of them, so. I wouldn't count on them necessarily meeting the 2015 deadline. So where does that leave us in the time being? Well, what the FAA has said is that thou, essentially thou shalt not operate drones, period. That's it. Um, however, hobbyists, i.e. us, get to fly because the rules which govern hobby operations were laid down in 1981 and have never been updated. If they'd foreseen this, they might have changed them a little bit, but they didn't. So we're perfectly cool as long as we stay below 400 feet, stay out of the hair of the local airports, and don't fly over a crowd of people or a Porsche dealership. So that's our, uh, that, th those are our restrictions. And they're, they're really pretty broad, which is why I think this sort of quirk of regulation has given hobbyists maybe a special role to play in this new technology as it comes of age. And, and we're certainly excited to play our part. So in theory, if you wanted to fly one to, say, document commercial, you know, do real estate aerial photography or any one of countless other things, get aerial shots for a TV show, whatever, you can't. However, everybody does. We, uh, we, don't, we don't charge, we're hobbyists, we do this because we enjoy it, but we've met people who have big, well-developed websites that say, we will fly our helicopter with our very sophisticated camera on the nose for you, and we've met these people, and they're making you know, video for TV shows you've seen on your television. 
And now the really bad news, I suspect, for all of you is if you're a public institution, the FAA has unfortunately created a process for you called the COA, Certificate of Authorization. And I've, I've given you just one of about the 25 pages of the online application process you will get to play with should you choose to do this. They have one, a lot of information about your aircraft, of course, a lot of information about your air crew. You have to have a class two medical certificate for two people, a pilot and a spotter. Class two medical certificate. The FAA, and, and you're gonna, this is, remember when I said this was a Kafkaesque nightmare, here we go. The FAA issues three, well, the, your aeromedical examiner issues three levels of medical <coughs> certificate. A class three medical certificate, which is what a private pilot needs, and you know, it's not impossible to get. You need good eyesight, and you know, you're not about to fall over dead, but you know, I mean, you know, any reasonably healthy person can probably get a class three medical certificate. A class two medical certificate is essentially the equivalent of a class three, except your eyesight has to be better. So I, as a private pilot, used to fly my Cessna 172 around Los Angeles, you know, some of the most congested airspace in the entire United States with a class three license. For me to fly this as, you know, as a professional working, say where I worked at a university, I want to do this, I would have to have a class two medical certificate, a higher level of medical certification to fly a six pound toy helicopter than to fly a manned Cessna 172. It, it literally makes no sense, but this is the place in which we find ourselves. And then a class one medical certificate is like for guys who fly 747s, and obviously there, you gotta be in pretty good shape. So in any event, so that's, it's, it's a bizarre world we're living in right now, and I don't think anybody who's looked at it for more than five minutes will tell you anything different. Well, double the flight time, we reduce the weight. That would do it right there. Because right now, this weighs a lot. It, it's, it's basically some steel components, some aluminum components, fiberglass, plastic. You, you change all it to carbon fiber, it's going to double the time immediately. Our, our largest bird will stay in the air twice as long. Un, unburdened, of course. The, the main thing is just getting it uh, to weight down. Or larger rotors. A full-sized helicopter will stay in the air a lot longer. Uh, it's far more efficient to run larger rotors. I, um, Brian refers to this, which this aircraft was built to my specifications, he refers to it as the battleship Yamoto, because I have this tendency to just overbuild everything, you know. <laughs> Could we make do with slightly smaller motors? Yeah, probably, but I want the really big ones, and it's just because I'm a believer in being overbuilt and, you know, ready to go, so. What do you find the most common point of failure to be other than pilot error? Um, well, second, we're our propellers. We actually, over time, got better and better ones to compensate for the breaking in midair. But that was a, because it's, it's constant fatigue. They, they flex a little bit in flight, and they would fatigue around the center here, and they just bust. Um, we haven't, knock on wood, had any electronics failures. Uh, but cheaper electronics, that, like the, the inexpensive Chinese ones, you're likely to, to pop an ESC or something where the motor just seizes, and then you drop one of the sky. And the cheap motors can burn out also. So the uh, seems to be pretty reliable? Very reliable. The, unless you go out of range. That's the only problem you've ever had is just simply going out of range. It okay. just... It, no, never happened. Uh, it's a spread, chart, it's spread spectrum. It changes channels a thousand times a second. It uses uh, synchronized lookup tables, so it's constantly hopping frequencies, so it's very likely to be jammed, unless you kill the whole frequency. We have not. <laughs> we like our aircraft too much. <laughs> you could probably do it. I mean, it's all on 2.4 gigahertz, so if you threw up a curtain of noise at 2.4, you, you'd do it. You'd yeah. probably blanket it out, yeah. But thank you all so much, and we really, oh. really appreciate it. And I, before we just before we go, one last thing I want to say: thank you to the people who made this, made it possible for us to make this trip. As hobbyists, you probably gathered we uh, we we're not, it's not like we're deep on budget to fly cross country. So thank you to the Natural Resource Analysis Center and uh, FLIR, the maker of thermal imaging cameras, who both stepped up and made it possible for us to be here. So thank you. Yeah.